not only would that have an immediate impact in the community, it would also have an impact on like a global scale. We we talk we were talking about earlier about who the people you're fighting against. You should use words like developers or you know, developers is the big one. But really, those are like big corporations that are worth billions of dollars, including BlackRock, which is a corporation that owns everything, that has their hand in medicine, that has their hand in the food processing, and also has a hand in the American dollars that are going over to Palestine right now to fund like an entire genocide. So like, how do you cut through a fence? one link at a time. So you disrupt something back home. You disrupt the a little bit of their money flow, which is off the base backs of tenants, off the backs of people who pay rent um, every month. Uh, you disrupt that just slightly, and then all of a sudden a little bit of their attention is taken away from all the hor- horrors that they're causing across the, the globe. And all of a sudden you start to feel like you're getting that power back that we feel so like lonely it makes us feel bad it makes us feel like we have no power when we are just scrolling on instagram or posting on twitter or whatever it is um all of a sudden like you were describing that community you look around pe- people you're genuinely affecting you're making their lives better and all of a sudden not only have you made a difference in your neighborhood you've made a difference in the country you've made a difference in the world Welcome back to Prospero's Pit. I'm joined here with Brian Hullaby and Jamie Hobbs, two members of KC Tenants Union here in Kansas City. Let's get right into it. What is KC Tenants Union? Uh, KC Tenants Union is it's a, it's a union made up of many unions. Uh, we're trying to start as many uh, unions in as many neighborhoods as possible, and they'll be under the umbrella of of KC Tenants, where like our general union, kind of like how you know UAW has like Ford and General Motors and whatever other other car companies. Something similar similar to that is what we'd like to have. Mm-hmm. And you guys are basically fighting against the. Um, I mean, you're fighting against many things, including multi billionaire companies like BlackRock and those things. But basically, you're fighting against. Uh, like the increasing of rent that is going yeah. throughout the United States, but specifically here in Kansas City. Yeah, well, you know, even though we try, we are addressing that uh, issues that are specific to Kansas City. Um, a lot of the new developers and people that are buying up houses are from other countries, and so um, sometimes the issues do get a little international, or mm-hmm. we, you know, it's hard to find who owns what or who can, you know, who's responsible for what. Can is a little more convoluted now. Yeah, because. Uh, they don't just live in other countries, but other states. You know, like um, one person that owns a particular large amount of amount of uh, property in Kansas City is actually based out of Cleveland. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Prey Park. It's the oldest black home co-op in the country, and uh, one of the people it's on it's for sale now, but uh, one of the people that wants to buy it is based out of St. Louis. You know, he has no sense of the, the Prairie Park's history or what it means or anything like that. He just wants to develop and make money. Mm-hmm. But he's not local. He's in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. So it gets hard. You know, you're fighting against people in California, Florida. Uh, it just gets, as we go along, the more the the, the more spread out the fight it is. Right, yeah. right. And I, I want to get into that, but I think we should, like, cover the basics really quick. And we were talking a little bit early, ja- earlier, Jamie, about, um, like, what is a union? For sure. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say, um, and this is just kind of my definition, but, um, and feel free to add anything, (laughs) but I would say that a union is just a group of people um, across, you know, any given divide, whether it's a racial divide, a religious divide, a sexuality, um, income, whatever it may be, people who come together um, to fight for a common goal. Mm Mm-hmm. And so in our case with Casey Tenants, our common goal is housing, affordable, safe, accessible housing. Right. 
And I think like the issue with like when it comes to housing and it feels like such a like um, tsunami of an issue that it's like hard to tackle. It's like no matter what people are going to move different places and like, you know, there is, you know, Kansas City has been a buzzword for like some time the past couple of years and you get people from out of state California, you know, where do you. Like how, how, what is it like to like kind of fight back against that wave? What is it, what do you guys do? What is your, you know, structure? Uh, well, our structure is, well, it's leader led. And so there is a small group of staff mm -hmm. that handles like day to day operations that have to get done. But as far as our separate teams, most of those are led by leaders who aren't paid. Um, and the people within those teams are also uh, not paid. But everything is done democratically. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do anything without the approval of the the entire base. Yeah. So no, not one group makes a single decision on their own, and no one person makes a decision on their own. Everything is run through the base, and so we all have a. Because of that, everybody that is a part of that base has a personal stake in whatever we're fighting for, mm -hmm. because they had input in the decision to to mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. Yeah, even to get you guys on the podcast, I knew you, you guys had to talk with the the whole team. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Again, it's just, uh, it's democratically run, like a truly, truly, a true dem democracy. Rather, mm -hmm. you know, it's again, even though there's some stuff like a few of us might really, really want to do that it might make sense to you know ten people. Mm -hmm. It could they could be right, but if the base doesn't agree, we don't do it. You know, we we move as a collective. But you know, after a while. Um, you start to trust each other. Mm -hmm. And so there becomes less and less like dissent. Everybody kind of just, you move together in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so there's no conflict or anything about it. Like we actually do get things done pretty easily and pretty quickly because of the personal relationships we've built and because of the trust we've built with each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure also it is the fact that you guys are all in the same community and you live in the same spaces and take up the same like neighborhoods that that kind of mission gels really well. What are like some of the events that you guys like put together to, you know, operate in fighting back against that? So I would say like the way it kind of works is we have weekly meetings. Um, well, let me back it up a little bit. So we are a citywide tenant union. So mm -hmm. that means the entire city north of the river, um, you know, down to like Westport, Midtown type of um, area over to the east side yeah. um, and South Kansas City. So like we are all over the city and each of those neighborhoods has like different needs, different interests, different things um, that they want to pursue. So that's kind of um, why Brian first said, you know, we are a union of many unions because like every kind of corner or area um of the city kind of has its own representation. Like Midtown has one, has its own neighborhood union. Mm -hmm. East side has its own neighborhood union. Um, but besides that, we also have a lot of working teams. So like we have a childcare team. So um, any meeting we have, you know, they organize to make sure that there's childcare um, provided for those that need it. Um, we have like a phone bank team who like, does like outreach through phone calling we have a hotline team that answers the phone calls with tenants who are um, facing crises um so we have all these different teams and so you asked about events we have i mean we have meetings like every single week you know any given team will have a meeting every week right and then besides that we do have like community events so like we just had like a potluck um this past weekend um, celebrating two years of the Midtown Tenant Union and everybody was invited. Everybody in the union, everybody in the city, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so we have like community building um, events like that. But then in addition, one of the main things, maybe some people might say the most powerful things we do is like um, our campaigns. So if a team decides to pursue a campaign, um, that could look like any number of things. It could look like shutting down a tax incentive from the city um, that the city is planning to give to a multi-million dollar corporation, mm -hmm. shutting that down, not letting it happen. Um, that's just an example of a campaign. Um, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of campaigns. Yeah, I, I can give you a specific um, answer. Uh, when we were doing the, uh, I believe it was a right to counsel, um, we had a very small window to get it done. But even though we were like kind of 
uh, I don't want to say unprepared, just kind of surprised by the, the opportunity once we recognized it. Uh, we didn't have time, a lot of time to organize, but uh, we made it happen and we made it uh, happen the way we always make things happen. That was still a democratically uh, chosen thing. But what happens first is that we recognize the need. Uh, we go to the strategy team, which is the, the team that sort of uh, looks at things and discusses things uh, first and says this might not be a good thing to do. But if it is, then we before we even do it, we take it to the base. And so we did it with the right to council. But then we had like we only had like two weeks. We realized there was no ordinance actually written, so we had to write one. And we wrote the ordinance in like forty eight hours, twenty four or forty eight hours. But uh, there was a specific team that worked on that, and we had no expertise in it. They were learning as they went along, so they were like doing like legal research while they're writing it. And uh, we still took that back to the base and said, is this something you guys like? Are you okay with uh, putting this out? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? It goes yes. And then we take the next step to uh, get the ordinance passed, introduce it to the city hall and, and mm -hmm. or council and get it passed. Um, so that's a, one example of um, a specific campaign and, and how it works. Mm -hmm. How many team members usually are involved in that? Uh, it depends on the, uh, what the team does. Um, most teams are anywhere from like five to twenty mm -hmm. uh, uh, people, but there, like I said, there's lots of lots of teams, lots of campaigns. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things working on. There's language justice team. There's the she went through some the hotline. We call them the hotline hotties. Mm -hmm. uh, they take up shifts uh, every week, cool. and they just sit there, answer the phone, and make return calls too to make sure that people who did call got the help they were. You know, we tried to help them get. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a co-governance team that uh, works with City Hall to uh, try and make sure that the people most impacted are the people they're talking to about housing issues. There's the sources of income team, which is worth mm -hmm. working on, uh, you know, doing a lot of stuff with that. Um, there is teams within the teams, groups within the teams. You know, like uh, Jamie and I are both on a co-governance team. But we're in two different <laughs> sub teams of the of the co governance team, mm -hmm. so you know things do get a little co uh, complicated. But it's to make sure that we can really dig into the things we want to dig into. We keep uh, so we break down the little teams to do like a lot of deep research and uh, put in like some really deep time into what we want to put out. Then we bring that to the larger team. Gotcha. And then we well, the larger team we take it to the base. Okay. Okay. Um, and is that directed by like your guys' own desire of being in whatever team you want? Yeah, we choose the teams we want to be in. Uh, one of the cool things about uh, Casey Tennant, and it's not like most other organizations I've I've been a part of. I've you know I tried to work with the working part working families party in New York City and a couple other things I just didn't really like doing. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that uh, really works is. Shit, I lost my train of thought. What did I just say? Um, Can you guys tell me? Yeah, yeah. You were talking about how, like, we choose what we do. Like, it's based off of, like, self-interest type of thing. Yeah, yeah. We choose what we what we do, and it's all based on self-interest. And um, we don't organize like uh, a lot of traditional organizations do. We It's actually, like, a pretty long and kind of uh, arduous process. We actually build relationships with the people that are impacted. Mm -hmm. And so when we see people that need help, we offer our help. And then we meet them where they are and we ask them what they want. And so we try and help them achieve what they want for their own building or their own neighborhood or sometimes their own house. Gotcha. So, um, but when we, when we work that way, the people we're trying to help mm -hmm. become more than like numbers. Yeah. It's, it makes our commitment deeper because we're like, it's not just, we got to go save Pervin Estates. Right. It's like, no, Mel is at Pervin Estates. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, do this the right way she might not have a place to stay mm -hmm. so um we don't treat the people we help as like numbers and we we build actual relationships yeah with the people we're trying to help. Basis. we we try to get there yeah yeah and, we, and one of the things we say is we build at the speed of trust mm -hmm. and so like i said we meet people where they are and so even people who want to join the organization um everybody's not built for like the day-to-day -day grind of organizing and so uh we we like it's we let people choose what they want to do, but they also choose their level of commitment. Mm -hmm. If they want to do more, then of course there's always more to do. But if they aren't comfortable with doing more, they just want to come to base meetings and stay educated about it. That's okay too. Right. 
So nobody is forced into doing anything they don't want to do. Mm. And that helps things grow because the people that are in those groups really want to be there. And mm. so putting in the work is not hard. Yeah. yeah. And like sometimes we have to have conversations like maybe nobody has capacity to do this thing. Like maybe we have these ideas, but we don't have the actual time energy among us right now. Um, and sometimes, you know, we just revisit things. Um, but yeah, exactly what, what Brian said. Um, we focus on our self-interest. So like that is, um, we just, we are always kind of personally coming back to like, why? Why do you do this? What drives you? And that thing changes, mm -hmm. you know, if for people who are doing it for, you know, some years now, the, the, the self-interest changes. But one good thing that we do is that we constantly revisit our self-interest. Sometimes it's to confirm what we thought it was before, but sometimes it's to find another one um, that will help keep you motivated. Because it does get hard to stay motivated when you're doing something that sometimes you put a lot of work into things that sometimes don't work. Mm -hmm. Or you're working towards things that um, you may not live to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, we're working towards municipal social housing. That That's a pretty lofty idea. And when we go into it, like we can get it done. But the truth is that a lot of things we want to see changed, uh, we may not live long enough to see. But that's okay. Cause that's just what we've chosen to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to get a little bit into your guys' own personal journeys and like why you chose specifically to get into these unions, if you're welcome to that. Yeah. You want to... Get into yours first. Yeah. 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 I would say um, me, my, the reason I kind of got involved. Um, So it kind of goes back to like 2020. Um, that was kind of whenever my, my, my worldview kind of shifted first politically. Um, I was never super, um, super activated with like things that were happening around me. Um, but you know, in 2020, most of us were kind of forced to kind of be at least aware in ways that at least I never had been before. Um, and that's kind of when I realized, Hmm, maybe I need to start doing things differently, like moving a little differently in the world. But I didn't join Casey Tenants until 2021. It was after, um, I, I, I actually used to be a journalist and um, I was working on a story about climate change in this community that um, was ravaged by like four horrible storms um, in, the, in the Gulf Coast. And um, the story ended up really focusing on these two women who they, they were they started out as strangers and they ended up becoming like best friends and forming a mutual aid organization. They ended up raising $30,000 in one weekend to help house people um, during a winter freeze. And their story really... Um, just kind of further like helped shape my perspective and I was like hmm I don't think I want to be doing this anymore I think I want to be more involved in the community um so to answer your question I that's when I first like after that job ended I was like I had heard of Casey Tenants and I was like I'm gonna give it a shot I went to a meeting and I was like everything they're saying matches with the things I've been thinking the things I've been feeling um so that's kind of what sparked me getting involved and then a few months after getting involved I started to explore what we call self-interest which is what we've been talking about we've mm -hmm. mentioned it a few times but that really is like on a deeper level what is your why for being here right is it just because I I saw two women who wanted to form a mutual aid group and help their community and I want to help my community no I realize you know it's not about me wanting to help my community it's about me wanting to help my myself too right? Those around me, but also myself. And I realized like, I realized like my whole life, I didn't really know what a community was. I didn't really know the, the meaning of community. Um, like, so I honestly, I grew up in a household, um, with an alcoholic. And so there was a lot of like in and out of rehab, jail, a lot of really scary car wrecks. And I just felt, you know, there was so much conflict around me that I wanted to escape a lot. And so I would spend a lot of time um, alone or just like away from the house, however I could. Um, and I ended up finding solace um, and like community and stuff like in the church. And I think the church, the Christian church, um, and it, I think it did provide a lot of love and stability for me at that time. 
but it wasn't until, um, and like I was going to church or church related events, like at least three times a week. Like it was really like my whole world. And it wasn't until I left my hometown, went to college, realized that like I could do something differently. I didn't have to go to church. And I realized like a lot of that, a lot of my experience, a lot of the things I experienced were like conditional. What I thought was like a loving, like secure relationship was actually contingent on like whether or not I wanted to devote my life to um, to a religion that I didn't necessarily even really understand. So I decided to move a little bit differently. Um, and I never really found a community until Casey Tenets. And that kind of that might sound cliche, but it is the truth. Um, so that is kind of my why. It it it, it makes me feel like less alone in this world. It may like if I didn't have Casey Tenants, I do feel like I would kind of go crazy. Um, I would just kind of be like fighting on my keyboard, you know, like fighting through the Instagram waves. Um, which I still do that sometimes, but I've started to learn that like that doesn't make me feel whole or feel purposeful, like what really does is having the power of like a community to like think and um, organize strategically and like change kind of the way that the world works around us. Mm -hmm. So it's really empowering for me. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And that I, I think you're not alone in feeling that way and feeling that, you know, um, you're not we're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not part of anything like real uh, fighting on on Instagram, on the social medias that take over our lives. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's going to resonate with a lot of people who are looking to get involved and looking to be a part of something. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the question. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, I was kind of forced into it mm -hmm. um, when I moved back from I lived in New York City for 15 years. Uh, I had to move back. Uh, it was not my choice. It was a, a lot of terrible things were happening in my life, and I was forced to move back in 2020. And, uh, of course, I had visited Kansas City, you know, here and there while I was living in New York. And I was so focused on seeing as many family and friends as I, as I could that I wasn't paying attention to the city around me anymore. And so when I moved back, um, yeah, I realized I saw that I was – you know, my neighborhood was crumbling and um, I started asking why nobody could give me an answer. Then I realized that they were trying to redevelop it and the residents didn't have much say and everybody was scared they were going to get kicked out and that the neighborhood would no longer be, gone, uh, be there. And so I was like, well, there has to be a way to, to, to fix this, to stop this, these uh, developers. And so I was on Twitter and I said, hey, does anybody here in Kansas City know any uh, lawyers, uh, housing lawyers that uh, specialize in like in co-ops? And uh, somebody from KC Tenants, I guess, was searching Kansas City housing and they found me and KC Tenants sent me a DM. And um, they said, come meet me tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I went to meet them and we had a great, great conversation that kind of opened up my eyes and. Um, gave me the confidence to put in some some more work. And so uh, that was a Wednesday. Saturday, I went to my first uh, base meeting. And um, it was on Zoom. This is the middle of the pandemic. Uh, it's on Zoom. And Tara, uh, who was my organizer, who, the one who found me, uh, asked me to introduce myself. And so I did. And uh, I hear a little voice uh, cracking and, and crying. And it says, Brian, is that you? And I, I look up. And it's the Diane Charity. Uh, I always called her Miss Diane. Um, she lived in Prairie Park um, pretty much my whole life. And she was best friends with my grandmother. And my grandmother had just passed that March. And so that was, you know, at this point, it, was, it had only been a few months since she had passed. And so that let me know that I was in the, the right place. And, um, and then once I got a better understanding of what I needed to do in Prairie Park, it kind of opened up. Uh, my eyes to Kansas City at you know at large. I was like, well, we can't be the only ones that are having this problem. And being in case tenants uh, opened up my eyes that like, wow, this this shit is happening like ev almost everywhere. And a lot for a lot of people, it was about like finding community. It was like trying to create a community. But I grew up in Parade Park. It was a co-op, and uh, we already had a really tight knit community like, and that had been there for generations. 
uh, my grandma and her husband and my mom moved to Prey Park in 1956. Uh, Prey Park was built in 1952, I believe. They went co-op in 1958. And a lot of the people that were there when it went co-op are still there. And so they these are families who have been together for generations. So like my grandparents uh, are, were friends, people live there, and then their kids became friends, and their kids' kids became friends. The people across from me have been there for 40 years, mm -hmm. and we've been there for, you know, longer. But it's not uncommon in Prairie Park. And so we actually had like a tight-knit community that's, you know, been kind of uh, eroded over the years. So, um, so yeah, some people join to find community. Other people join to, to keep theirs. And what made me decide to stick around for a while is, is that I was given the, the space to come to my own conclusions and uh, figure out how I wanted to move in that space and what I wanted to work on. And I'd never been a part of anything like that. Um, everything I had tried to do, I was kind of like forced in the roles that I was uncomfortable with. Uh, and that didn't happen in Casey Tenants. Like I was just, they gave me as much work as I asked for. And because of that, I was able to kind of grow into my role and grow into myself and, and kind of, I gave my time self to wake up and open my eyes to, you know, what's happening around me. And, um, I realized then that my personal interest was a lot broader than just saving parade park. Um, I, I realized that I wanted everybody to have a parade park. Mm -hmm. I wanted everybody to real to, to know the kind of community that I had. Um, having that kind of um, stability and that kind of, of, of base, it makes it possible to like pursue dreams that are irrational because you know that no matter what happens and where you go, you're going to have this place to come back to. And it's not just going to be your family that like welcomed you. It's going to be the whole community that welcomes you back. And that makes it easier to be away. It makes it easier to pursue dreams. Uh, it makes it easier to take risks. And I wanted other people to have that the stability that I had uh, growing up in, in Parade Park. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm trying to create lots of, lots of little Parade Parks for the city so that people can have the kind of childhood that I had. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, so you guys mentioned self-interest. Um, if anyone has ever gotten over that hump of... of uh, you know, going to a, an organization and talking to people and, you know, pulling those feelers out of putting, like, do I want to participate in this? Do I want to be a part of this community? Um, usually it's lit by some spark that happens. Like you guys both reference both of your sparks. How do you guys personally like keep that going and keep that fire going, keep like wanting to uh, participate in uh, Casey Tenants Union? There's always another fight. Um, yeah, none of us, you know, there's one th weird thing that people in the city kind of think sometimes is that we like to be at places causing trouble or yelling or, or chanting or whatever. And that's, couldn't be further from the, the truth. We would like to not have to do that. Um, and shit, I lost my train of thought again. What was I saying? You don't want to be causing trouble? Yeah, we don't like to cause trouble, but we're sometimes forced into doing it. Um, and other, and so that's also like at the tail end of what's already been a pretty lengthy battle of trying to do things like the, the more acceptable way, which is like to talk to somebody in city council, get their ear, try and talk to them and try and get them to, you know, slow down this ordinance or this bill or whatever it is that we want stopped. And um, we do that. We write letters. Mm -hmm. We make phone calls, we go to meetings, uh, we go to city council like to testify that this is not a good idea. And if those things don't work, then we show up to places and are a little more aggressive. But it's not something we enjoy doing. We would like to not do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that's fun. Yeah, uh, We prefer to be like behind the scenes, is doing the good work, helping people uh, on a personal like one on, almost a one on one basis mm -hmm. but sometimes council or i won't say council we are we're forced into situations where we have to be a little more aggressive mm -hmm. so got gotcha. you 
Yeah. Do you have to? Yeah, to like, so what I guess keeps me coming back is that I have seen that this works, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, we actually have made like tangible impacts here on our lives. Um, um, one of the things that Ryan actually mentioned earlier, the right to counsel, that's huge. I haven't personally been affected by that, but ha- the winning that campaign means that everybody in Kansas City, every renter who is facing eviction has a legal right to representation in court. And that is huge. Like that is not, um, we are one of just a few places in the country that have something like this for people. And usually if you go to eviction court as a tenant, um, like in over 90% of the cases, the tenant will not have representation. The landlord, of course, always will. Mm -hmm. And the tenant's always going to lose. But since this program has been in place in Kansas City, so many tenants have been able to stay in their homes because they have representation in court and they shouldn't be getting evicted in the first place. I mean, that is just the reality. So, so I keep coming back because I see it working. It gives me hope. Um, I mean, this world is so imperfect to put it lightly, you know, it's a like a monstrous place to live at times. Um, the horrors (laughs) that, you know, we witness and experience on a daily basis. Um, I just feel like if I didn't have a space like this, like I said, I, I think I would lose it. Like, oh, I, I would just fall, honestly, into a pit of despair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, and I've been there before. You know, I've been in some really dark places mentally. And um, it just all starts to feel more, it just all starts to feel more calm whenever you can, um, whenever the, the things that you're thinking and seeing and feeling are, um, validated and affirmed and, um, it, it just helps you move forward. It helps you find a way to keep going. Cause so many times I'm speaking for myself, but probably a lot of other people, you just want to give up. And, um, it's very normal be- to feel that way because a lot of these things that we're facing in this modern world are like impossible. Like, there are so many barriers to just, like, living mm-hmm. <laughs> at peace and just, like, having stability. So um, so we have to, like, I feel like I have to have this collective of people who will be there for me if if needed. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And um, to go back to, like, my why, um, it's unconditional. It's like you come as you are. You don't have to lie about who you are. You don't have to be anything you're not. We accept everyone. We have community agreements uh, that we read at the top of every single meeting. Um, you know, everybody is welcome here regardless of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good place for me to be. Yeah, and um, to kind of piggyback off of a. Uh... A couple of things uh, she said, um, speaking of the uh, how we'd rather do things and uh, how uh, we have to do things, uh, the right to counsel campaign was actually a great example of us uh, moving in a way that we prefer to move. Uh, the idea came about, we wrote some stuff, we got, uh, we got input from people on city council, we worked with them uh, to uh, make sure that it was right make sure that it was good and then uh city council helped get it passed and that's an idea of uh what we call co-governance which is what we want more of which is uh city council um working with the people in those communities um and then you know things do feel impossible sometimes like it feels it's easy to feel hopeless but I think that what we've uh, proven in Casey Tenants, you know, time and time again, is that nothing is is impossible when you have the right people around you and you're all moving in the same direction and you all believe deeply in, in what you're doing, that it's not impossible. Um, five years ago, people would have said, uh, seven years ago, if someone brought up something like a Tenants Bill of Rights, people would have laughed and said, that would never happen. But Casey Tenants made it happen. 
they would never they would say if we had said we're going to make sure that everybody who's getting evicted in Kansas City has a lawyer to represent them in court they would be like that's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard it will never happen sounds nice but it's not going to happen but we came together and we made that shit happen uh we endorsed people to run for city for city council uh we ran to people from our base uh for city council um six out of the eight people we ran uh won uh we've only been in an organization for what four or five years and we're not like we're not like the dnc where we've got like a ton of cash mm -hmm. you know like most of the people who are doing a lot of that work behind the scenes were volunteering there was no money involved for most of the people because we had a much deeper commitment to the cause uh because we're constantly revisiting our self-interest and making sure that that's still why we're why, why we're there and if that's not then we dig dig deeper to find a reason mm -hmm. you know and sometimes mm -hmm. i will lie for some people it runs out it's like i i i, I did it i did enough mm -hmm. but um for me there's i like challenges i like puzzles uh and so there's never another puzzle uh that doesn't need to be put together mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what makes me stick around and and i see the tangible changes uh nationally you know it's when you're working towards them it's hard to see those changes but on a local level those changes are like almost immediately tangible and can be seen and you can see the progress and that kind of keeps people coming back it's like we can, we can like hold our chain what we've done we can mm -hmm. say right to council worked and we've got the numbers and the data to prove that what we're doing worked and made a big change in people's lives uh, there have been times where people were going to get like evicted and we stepped in and they didn't. It's like a big change we saw mm -hmm. with our own eyes. So it's not just uh, trying to get someone to listen to do so they can do something for us is that we decided that we can make these changes happen ourselves. Right. And so that's kind of what, what we've done. And that keeps for me, that keeps me coming back uh, is that there's always another battle, always another fight and always another idea it's not always negative either like we just have great ideas that we want to see implemented that would help lots of people and those ideas don't come from negative places they come out of like you know hopeful and uh optimistic and and places of love and i think a lot of people might not understand that also is that we're there for love out of each other and love for the city and so like we're not just sitting around yelling at each other mm -hmm. if you came to a, a base meeting you'd probably be a little surprised at how we act uh, when we get around each other it's like family, mm -hmm. uh, we know everybody that's going to be there, and so coming together with them and uh, chasing a, a, a common goal, um, it just feels good. Like because you're doing it with people you care about, with friends, with people you some might sometimes consider family, mm -hmm. and that just makes it easier because you you all feel the same way about something, and so we keep each other motivated. Because a lot of times, like uh, we talk about this in meetings a lot, we all feel like stuck or you know a little hopeless or a little like exhausted sometimes coming to those meetings re like it re-energizes us mm -hmm. because they're the meetings that we have are so full of like of, of love and optimism and, and hope uh that uh it's rejuvenating uh, mm -hmm. it's not like a lot of other organizations we're not very reactionary mm -hmm. like we're not just sitting in meetings like screaming like fuck developers and fuck scum lords like, that happens but most of the time we're laughing, we're coming up with great ideas together, we're having fun, we're loving each other. It's a very hopeful environment. And like uh, Jamie was saying, everybody is is welcome. Um, we, we meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. And so um, nobody is judged. Um, you just feel, I've never really felt that kind of energy before to walk into a place and be and feel immediately accepted and immediately uh cared for and cared about and that keeps a lot of people involved and it keeps us coming back it keeps us rejuvenated and fresh honestly mm -hmm. yeah wow it was beautifully said from both of you guys um and yeah like just to say what you were saying how this world can be really harsh and really ugly at times sometimes that's overwhelming to face so much love at once and um you know especially someone who comes from say a broken home or like some sort of damage mm. uh, that's almost even scarier to face down than the actual ugliness of this world but um i'm really curious what do you guys got going on right now like what is what is casey tenants union working on right now um 
A lot of things. So, like... <laughs> yeah, how much time do you have? Yeah. I feel like we should first mention the source of income campaign. Yeah. Um. So, that is probably our most, like, um. what would you say, like, urgent campaign right now? It's our main focus right now. Main okay. focus. So, the source of, so source of income discrimination is whenever... A prospective renter gets denied um, on their um, application because of where they get their income, their source of income. So whether it be a housing voucher, whether it be tipped wages, um, other examples. If you're if you're a graphic designer and you work for your, for yourself and you're just like uh, kind of a freelancer you might not be able to find an apartment no matter how successful you are. You could have, you know, six figures. You're making six figures a year, but because you don't have a traditional job with a traditional company, they're going to say that hire, like bringing you in, not hiring you, but bringing you in is a risk. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is kind of eliminate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to say, um, you know, if you have the money, there should not, the landlord should not be able to discriminate against you and say, well, your money comes from this place. So you can't live here. Mm -hmm. Your money comes from a Section 8 voucher. We won't accept you. I mean, that is um, one of the biggest um, things we are fighting for is for those who, I mean, this is just my opinion. I think it's all equally as important. But like, if we're talking about housing vouchers, um, black single mothers are actually disproportionately impacted by that specific type of income because they um, hold voucher um, housing vouchers at a higher rate. And is that accurate? Yeah, the uh, the highest uh, the group of people that have the highest uh, rate of eviction are forty nine year old single mother black single mothers, mm -hmm. and it's and it's a overwhelming discrepancy. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, right. but it's it's a pretty it's clearly a problem mm -hmm. when you look at the data. Right. But so yeah, if you are impacted by source of income discrimination, um. Now's the time to get involved in this fight. I mean, it is the I have been to a couple meetings for this campaign, but not recently. So I can't speak too much on the up to date information about it. But 100 percent, you can reach out on our social medias. Um, you can fill out the new member form, which is online. Casey Tennant's new member form. And you can get plugged in um, to join that specific fight. Mm -hmm. Um. What what else is cooking? What else? <laughs> What's good in the neighborhood? Language justice is something that we're working on too. Language access, language justice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the city who don't speak English, and because of that, they don't have access to a lot of uh, a lot of help or a lot of services that they might need. Uh, they get evicted, and they don't under they can't understand what's being told to them uh, because there's no translators in the court. They're not required to have anything like that. They're not you know most papers are. are um, literature from the city a lot of it is not required to be in multiple languages mm -hmm. and so um what we want to do is uh we're trying to to do i think i think will be successful is um making sure that no matter what language you speak that you have access to everything uh, the city is doing and that you can be understood and that you can be heard uh in any city uh function or any city building or doing any kind anything with the city mm -hmm. So um, that's something else we're also working on. We're, there's a co-governance team, mm -hmm. which is working on uh, building relationships with um, people in the city, not just uh, like people on city council, but like people on boards and staff at city council sometimes, you know, just trying to get to know people uh, better and build, again, what we do is build relationships. So we're trying to build relationships with, uh, you know, people at city hall. Uh, there's a, uh, man, at the hotline hotties, if you, like or think you might enjoy just like taking calls and uh calming people down uh, getting them uh put you know we're not a service organization so we can't like get people housing but we can point them in the right direction and try and find resources for them mm -hmm. if that's something you want to do you can do that um like i said we meet people where they are and there's a lot of teams happening a lot of ideas being pop popped around and so no matter what you want to do, there is, I'm sure, you can find something right within Casey Tennant's to do. Is a you know of course like a, a press team that mm -hmm. works with the you know press. And there's a just 
lots of lots of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of teams. And then also we also have the separate unions too. Those are made up of people in KC tenants. Yeah. So there's the East Side Tenants Union that is uh, right now we uh, meet at the uh, WEB Du Bois Center. Yeah. Uh, Tuesdays at six. And there's the MTU uh, Midtown Tenant Union. Uh, there's the Parvin and Estates Union. Mm-hmm. There's you know, lots of little unions all across the city that we are involved with or that we've uh, helped build. Mm-hmm. And so um, those separate unions are working on things that uh, are you know just within their communities. So that's happening. And then there's stuff working on like citywide mm-hmm. also. And it's just their, you know, there are a million things that we're working on at the same time. And yeah. And I would say besides the like exciting, like campaign um, things like that might seem more exciting. We're always doing things like on the back end too, like thinking about like long-term goals, um, trying to build our base, trying to, you know, bring more people into the union. Um, So things like that are always happening. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, municipal social housing um, is one of the long-term goals we have, and we right. are constantly working towards that. Yeah. That is something that we never stop working on. Mm-hmm. Um, and municipal social housing would be the housing that is heavily subsidized or completely paid for by um, the city or the state or the federal government um, that anybody would have access to if they needed housing or just wanted to stay there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that would, that would fix a lot of issues. Um, homelessness and housing and inst- just being unstable like not being able not knowing if your all your belongings are going to be tossed onto your yard when you come home from school um can cause a lot of problems you know it causes people to act um in a way that they might not normally act you know, i've been homeless a couple times in my life um but i was able to i was able to do that in a you know not so destructive way because i knew that my community would be there when I decided to, you know, stop being stupid mm-hmm. and get my stuff together or whatever. Most people don't have that kind of community. And so like getting like municipal social housing and getting some people who are in like really unstable environments into stable environments, that's going to reduce crime. It's going to make the city uh, cleaner. It's going to make the city healthier. It's going to raise people's hopes. It, it, you know, it just would go a lot to, it, Changes a lot of issues for a lot of people, and everybody would be able to feel that relief if it were to to happen. It'd be good for the entire city, not just for the people who can't afford housing or need housing, but for everybody else too. Right. One hundred percent. Yeah, and even um, I mean, though everything you just talked about would have immediate impact in the community. Um, bus just rolled through. Uh, um, but yeah, I think that even on a not only would that have an immediate impact in the community, it would also have an impact on like a global scale. We, we talk, we were talking about earlier about who the people you're fighting against. You should use words like developers or, you know, developers is the big one, but really those are like big corporations that are worth billions of dollars, including BlackRock, which is a corporation that owns everything that has their hand in medicine that has their hand in the food processing. And, also has a hand in the American dollars that are going over to Palestine right now to fund like an entire genocide. So like, how do you cut through a fence one link at a time? So you disrupt something back home, you disrupt the, a little bit of their money flow, which is off the base backs of tenants, off the backs of people who pay rent, um, every month, uh, you disrupt that just slightly, and then all of a sudden, a little bit of their attention is taken away from all the hor- horrors that they're causing across the, the globe. And all of a sudden, you start to feel like you're getting that power back, that we feel so like lonely. It makes us feel bad. It makes us feel like we have no power when we are just scrolling on Instagram or posting on Twitter or whatever it is. Um, all of a sudden like you were describing that community look around people you're genuinely affecting you're making their lives better and all of a sudden not only have you made a difference in your neighborhood you've made a difference in the country you've made a difference in the world yeah and uh even uh kind of talking about that um we don't just get ideas from other organizations in the country uh we look at how housing is run in other countries we look at other 
countries that have municipal housing and we research how they did it, how they're doing it now, uh, how people who don't live in it feel about it, uh, how to, how they make it work. And there's so many great ideas and creative things that, um, we could do. And there are, the ideas are worldwide. And so, so yeah, the issue is worldwide and mm -hmm. fixing things here. Uh, we've already inspired other people in other cities to start their own uh, tenant unions to take up the same kind of fight in their city. And we hope that influence just goes from not just to other states, but then across the world in any place where uh, people are marginalized, that those marginalized communities can see that a bunch of weirdos in Kansas City came together under a common cause, did a lot of great shit and mm -hmm. changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And also, uh, speaking of military contractors, um, Prairie Park is being sold uh, uh, next year. It's a complicated issue that we don't have time to get into because mm -hmm. I'll talk for 20 hours. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, Episode two. HUD uh, chose a management company to manage the property. It's called Loomis. And they've been really great to us, really good, uh, kind. They've done more for us than any management company has in the last 15 years. They're also military contractors. Mm. And so um, that causes causes you to have to do some mental jujitsu to uh, know that the rent you're paying is probably going to fund some kind of horrible war crime somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere else. But um, there's no choice. We can't not have management. We don't have any control over who HUD wants to manage us. And so we're just kind of, kind of stuck. And so what we want to do is prevent those kinds of things from happening. And with strong unions, we can intervene, intervene in those things and have a bigger part in what happens to our own neighborhoods. Because I, I don't think most of the people in the neighborhood would have chose a military contractor to be our, our housing managers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, or be our management company for, you know, where we live. So, um, so yeah, it's it can be, like you said, BlackRock, other military contractors, yeah. other governments are just buying up property yeah. like crazy. And um, putting an end to that or slowing it down can be hard, but we've done it. Mm -hmm. So again, like once you can see, you can hold those wins, it gets easier. And I won't lie, like sometimes the wins aren't like obvious to the city. Sometimes it's just that we block like some fucking slumlord from buying a, a property. And... uh I, I won't lie, like running a slumlord off or f kind of forcing them to make a change they don't necessarily want to make feels really fucking good. <laughs> so I bet. you get a couple of those wins and that feeling gets a little, you know, it is like a, it's like NFL players once they win the Super Bowl, you're like, well, maybe they, maybe they now they feel complete, like their career is worth something. Like, no, once you win that one, I want to, you want to win more. Yeah, right. It's kind of like that. Like, mm -hmm. once you see a change that you can hold a change that you made, or you just run some awful person off and help a lot of people, it, it's, it gives you a little high. Yeah. And uh, it also, it also keeps a lot of people around too. Yeah. Amazing. Do you have any closing thoughts, Jeremy? So something that was um, popping into my head, actually, when you used that fence analogy, how uh -huh. do you how do you break down a fence? You cut one link at a time. Um, Diane Charity, one of the members of our base that who Brian actually founding talked about. founding member, yeah, she's a founding she's member a founding. of uh, Casey Tenants. Okay, cool. She has this she has this saying: How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so, like. Um, so that is just something that really kind of propels me. It's like, it just really, it, it speaks to how crucial the mindset is. We all have to make sure that we're maintaining hope somehow. And how do we do that? Well, we take care of ourselves. We take care of each other. And we're also honest, you know, these, these problems, this like $2,000 a month rent, these are huge issues, right? These, um, underfunded schools, um, lack of health care, lack of safety, all of these are huge, huge, huge problems. But the truth is we're also all working together to help resolve these problems and find solutions that actually work for us. Um, so you just have to m keep that mentality, you know, like don't lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, 
and say that like we can do it like we can fix everything um don't be delusional i guess but you do have to have a little bit of that delusion right you know <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, i guess that would be my closing thought yeah you you do kind of have to be a little weird to look at a, a a problem as complicated as housing and then being like you know what I got it. <laughs> you got to be a little off to do that. But right. being around other people who are a little off makes you not off. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 But if you go too deep into that, you realize it's all crazy. But uh, <laughs> you know. It is. You, you yeah. got to be a little crazy to run and run for, for office. Like these, these problems are like massive. Mm -hmm. And for some people to just like be looking at something like housing or anything that's big and complicated being like, you know what? Nah, I got it. Yeah. Put me in there. I got it. Yeah, give me a, give me a year, <laughs> and I'll fix it. Mm -hmm. You gotta be a little wacky to do that. So, like you said, the the delusion is necessary. Yeah, but also, you know, when you get some wins, it becomes less and less of a delusion, and you're like, holy shit! Like these things aren't dreams. Yeah, like we're we can make these things happen. Mm -hmm. And so they they don't they start to exist outside of like your dreams and hopes, and they become things that you can actually make happen. Yeah, and that's the uh, the beautiful thing about Casey Tennant. Yeah, it's just the most empowering, like, badass feeling to realize that, like, change is possible. Um, and also to realize that, like, no one person can change the world. Like, you have to figure out how to find common ground, how to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing, guys. Where, if, if people want to volunteer after watching this episode, where should they go? They can reach out to us on Twitter, uh, but the quickest way is to go to kctenants.org and fill out the new membership form, and somebody will get back to them, uh, you know, as quickly as as we can, but pretty quickly yeah. to talk about how they want to be involved, if they want to be involved at all, or you know, if they just want to be a, a you know a base member. Mm -hmm. But somebody, a person will reach out to every single person that calls. So um. So yeah, that's that's the easy way to go. It's not hard to join. Like yeah. it's super easy. It doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit of time. So it, it, fill out the membership form. You remember? <laughs> that's yeah. That's how it goes. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on, you guys. I really appreciate the time you took to be here. This has been really cool. Yeah. Like uh, I like that it was a uh, more of a conversation. We do also another thing we're working on. We have a we have a radio show or a podcast. Oh wow! Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts. Uh, it's on KKFI every third. Thursday. At, I knew I was uh, dealing with professional. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're dealing with it, you're an AV nerd who <laughs> circled back around to being an AV nerd after uh -huh. high school. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that and we're doing a show uh, thurs this Thursday. It'll be about uh, language language justice and it's going to be really cool and so we hope lots of people uh, tune and listen. Um, you can find us on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, we'll be tweeting about it. And talking about it on Instagram and Twitter and stuff to find out more information about that. But yeah, just hit up the website, fill out the form, and you're in. Awesome. That's super exciting. Thank <laughs> you guys again for being a part of this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's just really cool. Yeah.